Good morning. I'm Mackenzie Babb, Director of External Affairs for the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise at UNC Keenan Flagler Business School. I am so pleased to welcome you here today for the launch of our new report, Seven Forces for Shaping the Economy. The report examines the current state of our economy with a particular eye toward the upcoming election and explores the most critical trends set to drive change for the short and long term at the state, national, and global levels. If you haven't had a chance to do so yet, I encourage you to check out keenaninstitute.unc.edu slash seven forces, that's seven spelled out. Uh, there you can find the report in full, along with a supplemental report offering additional insights specific to the state of North Carolina and a policy brief. During today's briefing, you're gonna hear from a number of experts whose insights and work have contributed to the report and its findings. Then during the second half of our conversation, we're gonna open things up for your questions. For reporters who are joining us via webinar, you are welcome to submit your questions anytime using that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And of course, for reporters joining us by phone, you are welcome to submit your questions to me directly via email. My email address is mckenzie underscore bab at keenan-flagler.unc.edu. Um, with that, it is my pleasure to turn things over to our first speaker, Keenan Institute Executive Director, Professor Greg Brown. Greg? Um, thanks, Mackenzie, and, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, as Mackenzie said, I'm Greg Brown. I'm finance faculty here at Keenan Flagler Business School and the executive director for the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise. Uh, obviously, we're very excited to be releasing this report on seven forces reshaping the economy. Um, I want to start by uh, recognizing the large number of people that were involved in this. It was a, it was a really significant effort. Uh, it um, was really uh, a couple dozen academic experts uh, that we drew on uh, from multiple universities. Um, we also had substantial input from top executives in private sector business as well as policy experts. And in fact, really the raw material for this report came from discussions with our CEO forum um, that was coordinated by UNC Keenan Flagler uh, Business School uh, and the Keenan Institute. Um, and, through those discussions, we identified you know, more than a, a couple dozen important uh, business dislocations, uh, which through careful analysis, we were able to effectively trace back to seven uh, unifying forces. And we obviously can't claim that this is a 100% comprehensive discussion of all that's in play right now with the economy, but we really feel that we've been able to capture the vast majority of trends and forces that are driving changes in the economy currently and, and likely to continue uh, affecting the economy for the foreseeable future. Um, I also want to mention, as McKinsey said, there, there's actually two reports. There's the main report that describes the forces at a national, international level and how they're shaping the economy. And there's a companion report that's much longer, has a lot of additional detail, including specific policy and business operation recommendations with a specific focus of North Carolina as an example. So both of those are available for download on the um, Key Institute website and the, the, uh, the dashboard. The economy, you know, significant um, uh, downturn in, in um, March and April left the economy down about 30%. And then we started to see a rebound in May and June that brought the economy back to within about 10% of the pre-pandemic output levels. Um, but you know, that's sort of the bad news as well in the sense that the economy uh, really has been treading water and stuck at those output levels since mid-June. And there's some worrying signs that um, growth is stalling. Uh, and that, you know, especially among smaller businesses, which we think are the most vulnerable uh, in this current climate. So. Um, understanding why the economy has stalled and what we can do about it is really the primary goal of the seven forces analysis. And as an example, I want to quickly talk through uh, our analysis of what's probably the most obvious economic force um, currently in play, and that's the accelerating shift to on-demand and, and at-home retailing. So, um, of course, the shift to online retailing has been happening for 20 years. Um, but the shock from the pandemic has really rapidly upended that market uh, even further. And in 2020, we're likely to see the closure of more brick and mortar retail outlets than in any year in US history. So uh, at, at the same time that um, we see this, this real pressure on traditional retailing, we're also seeing certain segments of the market like grocery and delivery uh, with an explosion in demand. Uh, and unlike prior economic downturns uh, where kind of everything declines uh, at the same time, 
we've seen these real kind of tearing of uh, the retail industry with substantial positive pressures in some areas and negative pressures in other areas. Um, this has affected supply chains and most importantly, it's impacted um, workers and the labor force. Um, and I think it's also clear that this is not a temporary shift. There may be a temporary component to it, but consumers have now learned how to consume goods and services differently, and this is going to persist. Uh, and a, you know, probably a, a prominent uh, uh, example of this is some less tech savvy consumers, so think older consumers, have now learned how to do more online um, shopping, especially things like online grocery um, uh, uh, ordering and even some other essential types of, of goods and services. And th these skills are likely to persist and affect uh, the type of consumption that happens even after the pandemic isn't limiting their ability or, or raising concern about their ability to go to the store. So importantly, the statistics tell us that these types of shifts uh, have affected some populations more than others. So specifically, we know that lower income households uh, people of color, women, and especially single women with children have been disproportionately impacted both by the health risks of the pandemic, but also the economic uh, downturn. And of course, this ties back to the work that these groups um, do, which is disproportionately in the retail goods and services industry. So while there's been growth in employment for online and on-demand jobs, these are often different skill sets, um, different physical locations, uh, sometimes inferior jobs in the sense they have lower pay, or fewer benefits or uh, gig economy type of jobs. So our report identifies these issues, but also importantly, we wanna look ahead at what can be done to sort of mend this tear in the labor market um, around retail and around online uh, uh, goods and services and e-commerce and help get the economy back to full employment as quickly as possible. So we have a variety of, of recommendations, but here's just a couple. Um, this is an opportunity for reskilling and upskilling of um, certain segments of the labor force. We know that there's this temporary slack in the labor force and we can take advantage of that to have these people um, un undertake new skills and um, uh, workforce development programs that will make them more competitive and lead to higher incomes and higher productivity in the future. Another is that location is less important now in, in many businesses. So certain areas with competitive labor markets can attract components of the retail goods and services supply chain that are not location specific. So these can be anything from production of specialty goods to logistics, fulfillment. Um, so for example, many jobs that might've been concentrated in high cost urban areas can move to lower cost geographies and suburban areas. So um, as you can see, taking advantage of these opportunities will likely take a combination of efforts across private sector business and government policy um, both are going to need to make new investments and policy will have to do things like adjust regulatory framework to uh, include do things like including uh, reducing regulatory barriers and and uh, prevent uh, that prevent movement of labor across occupations. So um, with that, I want to turn it over to David Carroll, who is a senior fellow with the Keenan Institute and the chair of the North Carolina CEO Forum. Thank you, Greg, and good morning. As Greg said, I'm David Carroll. I'm a retired banker of 38 years with Wells Fargo and currently a private equity investor in Charlotte. And I'd like to share a few thoughts on how we think financial markets and capital providers will adjust to the risk in the new economic environment ahead. Here on the heels of the election, I'm reminded of that expression, elections have consequences. Well, recessions have consequences, and we don't think we've yet experience the brunt of all those consequences caused by the pandemic and the economic shutdown. Congress provided over $3 trillion and the Federal Reserve over $6 trillion in much needed fiscal and monetary support. That's gone a long way to provide a financial lifeline for millions of impacted workers, and it's kept financial markets functioning well. But the payroll benefit has run out, and the bulk of monetary support has gone towards preserving asset values for existing and largely publicly traded financial instruments, not new capital issuance. Private company access to capital is and will likely be another story. Recall that the unemployment uh, rate peaked somewhere around 15% in mid-spring. It was actually closer to 20% when you include about 5 million in furloughed workers, but unpaid, which are not included in the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculus. 
that number has improved a great deal. It was down to about eight and a half percent in August. But again, that doesn't include a very large wave of expected largely white collar furloughs in the coming months. So the, the pain so far has been felt mostly by lower paid hourly workers. Expect the next phase to fall much more heavily on higher paid middle income families and professionals as employers adjust or right size employment for the expected revenue environment ahead. Coming into the pandemic, household debt had grown over 30% since the financial crisis, with US consumers holding over $4 trillion in non-housing debt and over $10 trillion in housing related debt. So pretty leveraged, pretty fully leveraged and not really well positioned for declines or in many cases, a total loss of income. We expect capital access to private, middle market, and small closely held businesses to be severely strained. Underwriting criteria is tightening while balance sheets and business conditions are weakening for those companies. Industries so far that have been hardest to hit have been hospitality and hotels, bars and restaurants, travel and transportation, sports and entertainment, motion pictures and recording, elective medical procedures, and as Greg touched on, non-online retail. These are all typically large employment sectors. Expect record business failures. That is not firms closing permanent, that's firms closing permanently, not reorganizing through bankruptcy. Because of the government stimulus mentioned earlier, much of the effects of this have yet to be felt. Another major shoe to drop is the ultimate impact of mortgage and residential rental forbearance agreements and consumer debt extensions put in place over the last eight months. For the vast majority of those, recapture and repayment will be expected. Now, the good news in all of this, if there is any, that banks, non-bank lenders, private equity investors, pre-pandemic came into this in very good shape with high capital reserves and a lot of liquidity. So we don't expect this to spiral into a systemic financial crisis like in 2008, 2009. However, lenders and investors are bracing for extremely large credit losses and permanent deterioration in employment and wages in material sectors of the economy. And that will be reflected in more conservative underwriting criteria and generally a lower risk appetite. Now, clearly there are businesses and sectors, as is noted in our report, that are and will thrive in this economy. In North Carolina's financial services sector, our banks, our non-bank lenders, asset managers, fintech companies, and private investors are well positioned to support that growth. Bottom line though, expect it to be a while before permanent job losses, business failures, and credit defaults peak and return to pre-crisis levels. Our report outlines a number of areas of opportunity to prioritize in dealing with this, and Greg touched on a few. Workforce development and retraining, universal broadband access, fortifying existing and surviving businesses as opposed to chasing perhaps new businesses, and housing, just to name a few. To capitalize on those though, I think it's fair to suggest we're gonna need much more and better public-private collaboration and more specifically targeted government support. So thanks, and I'll now turn it over to Jimmy Rosen, CEO of Artisan Biosciences to talk about shocks to healthcare and pharmaceutical demand. Jimmy. Thank you, David. Uh, it's been a privilege to learn from you over this process, I have to say. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the shocks to healthcare and pharmaceutical demand, which is listed as the sixth of the seven forces. And I'm also going to, by reference, uh, include um, some of the onshoring conversation that is the third of the seven forces. So, uh, as David said, my name is Jimmy Rosen. I'm the CEO of Artisan Biosciences and uh, adjunct faculty at the UNC Gilling School of Global Public Health. Um, we'll start with hospitals. Um, so as the report outlines, U.S. hospital losses from March through June exceeded $200 billion. Uh, most of that is unrecoverable. As we know, acute care uh, evaporates and, um, and hospital-based care typically operates at capacity, which means that uh, surgeons, uh, let's say, who show up early in the morning round on their patients, they go into the operating room for the vast majority of the morning, and then they round again and have clinics in the afternoon they're already working the maximum number of hours they can work and the operating rooms are operating at full capacity. So the losses that they've incurred over the last six months don't return. And just as a frame of reference, the typical hospital 
uh, and tertiary care facility may make a 10% margin over the course of the year, which means that you know, if a, re a really big hospital that does a billion dollars worth of business in a year may have $100 million um, at the end of the year on which they can spend on, um, on maintenance, capex, upfit, building new buildings, et cetera. Um, so the hospitals that have incurred losses over the course of the last six months will take uh, years to recover from those setbacks in their ability to provide advanced care. Unfortunately, the impact of this has been disproportionate on uh, primary care and rural facilities. So small rural hospitals, especially in the state of North Carolina, have been closing at an alarming rate. And this is increasing uh, the healthcare disparities, especially uh, for people of color and people who live in rural outlying areas. Um, we've seen this issue manifest itself much more aggressively during COVID times, and we only can predict that it will accelerate. Um, the, uh, one of the things that the report does a really nice job of outlining is how we can migrate some of healthcare to telemedicine. So you say, well, telemedicine seems obvious, and why wouldn't people want more telemedicine? And uh, frankly, during COVID, anecdotally, you've been hearing about people who had a telemedicine visit, and they say, well, I logged on, I could do whatever I needed to do while I was waiting for the physician to show up. We had a good visit. The physician was able to ask me the exact same questions that I would be asked in person. I didn't have to pay $5 for parking. I didn't have to wait an hour in a waiting room. And my visit was very efficient. So people would say, well, why doesn't healthcare migrate more aggressively towards telemedicine? And why did it take a pandemic to open people's eyes to, um, to the potential here? Well, part of it is that the way hospital systems and healthcare systems are set up, you may notice that you get a bill from the hospital and you also get a bill from the provider. And um, telemedicine does not come for free. When people have a telemedicine visit, they simply say, well, I logged on, I spoke to a physician for five minutes, I logged off and I got a $100 bill. And um, it's very hard for people to reconcile that and it's hard for hospital systems to take that, uh, that um, centralized service that they provide and externalize it. So hospitals, first of all, are gonna need to figure out, and hospitals and healthcare systems, I should say, are gonna need to figure out how they build in that, um, that IT infrastructure charge into their billing process and replace some of what they call the facility charge um, uh, with an IT charge. And that may seem straightforward, but in an antiquated system like billing and medical records for hospitals, it's actually quite challenging. Um, one of the, this, and this is one of the places and opportunities that we really think North Carolina can excel. North Carolina has IT infrastructure and expertise North Carolina has some of the best healthcare in the world. And if they can integrate these two processes to um, add, efficiencies, add efficiencies to hospitals and health systems, that would be a major contribution for the state of North Carolina. I'll now switch uh, and briefly talk about um, the pharmaceutical industry. One quick comment um, about uh, what relates to Operation Warp Speed and vaccine development. Obviously central and crucial to getting uh, to getting the world back on track and the world economy back on track. Um, but a, a, a note of caution that Operation Warp Speed is an anomaly. For the federal government to assume all the risk, uh, or the, let's just say the vast majority of the risk, in an R&D effort like vaccine development um, is, uh, is something that you might see once in a generation. Something like a cancer moonshot or the war on drugs gets people's attention and it gets a lot of federal dollars. But the risk ultimately gets distributed to the pharmaceutical companies or the, or the people who are delivering the care. So how do, we, um, how do we combat that? Well, one of the ways, and this is where I'm going to bring in um, uh, uh, the um, force number three, is, um, is by onshoring um, certain activities. And North Carolina is very, very well equipped to do this. Over the past 30 years, we've seen a massive amount of offshoring activity in both services and manufacturing. Uh, in the healthcare industry. And 30 years may seem like a long time, but we were able to do it pretty efficiently and we should be able to return some of that. So um, providers, policymakers are gonna need to turn their attention to what are the essential medicines that we need to bring back um, onshore? What are the alliances that we're gonna need to make with our allies to make sure that essential medicine production and distribution is centralized? And how do we make sure that we can get those services and medicines distributed um, uh, equally 
across our population, regardless of location and socioeconomic background. And then finally, uh, let me just talk quickly about the CRO industry, the clinical research organizations uh, that have a large presence in the state of North Carolina. Um, these will also benefit from telemedicine and monitoring, excuse me, monitoring of clinical trials remotely uh, can be transformational to the clinical research organization industry. And it's something that we really ought to focus on as a state in North Carolina in building our effort there. So let me stop and turn it over to Delisa Alexander. Also, you know, thanks so much for the Keenan Institute authoring this report and highlighting the urgent need we have to create solutions for these issues, including issues in the workplace um, due to the impending of childcare and educational challenges, which is trend five in our report. Um, I'm Delissa Alexander, Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer at Red Hat. We're an enterprise open source software company and the open hybrid cloud technology leader. And some of the context I'll offer is from that vantage point. We have offices and people around the globe that are also part of you know, my remarks. Um, and we've been in a work from home mode as our default around the globe for the last six months. So these issues that we're gonna talk about are also now being highlighted beyond our work, particularly with the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was such a strong advocate for equality in the workplace. And we have an opportunity to be purposeful about how we as a society think about long-term solutions. I was just reading Forbes article that really resonated with me and it characterized caregivers as drawing on reserves of heroic proportions as they navigate the volatile and uncertain and ambiguous world with all the challenges of the pandemic and the impacts on the economy and their incomes and educational responsibilities and impacts from um, you know, emotions based on what's happening with social un unrest in our world. And the New York Times recently raised the alarm saying um, that the pandemic is a mental health crisis for parents. And these challenges are magnified for women and minorities and can lead to burnout and career dropout. And so what we've seen progress in a number of measures for equality for women, the need to take on additional healthcare responsibilities during the pandemic creates new pressures, pressures that we don't have aligned policy responses for. And the Keenan Report highlights that pre-pandemic, students spend an average of more than 30 hours a week in school, not including extracurricular activities, as well as before and after school care. That's a lot of infrastructure that working parents relied on. And all this support structure has been upended, leaving parents to manage not only doing their jobs, many of them in a remote environment, but also educating their children at the same time. And despite a lot of progress, not all parents are created equal. Research tells us that women still shoulder more childcare responsibilities than men in general. Uh, for example, last month, there was a new study by Allraise that um, found that pre-pandemic, 11% of women founder, founders um, regularly spent more than seven hours on caregiving, while 0% of male founders did. And now with the pandemic, 52% of female founders spend more than seven hours a day on caregiving, while only 26% of male founders do. So it's interesting, despite um, female founders spending more time on caregiving, they report no impact to their revenue. But that seems like a recipe for burnout. Um, but for those women who don't own their own businesses, we can see additional risks to their career trajectories that we need to mitigate. And we wonder, you know, to meet these new demands, are women more likely to ask for reduced hours or pursue less demanding jobs and thus see reduced pay? And are men generally less likely to seek reduced work responsibilities and thus be present and more likely to be top of mind for career opportunities and increases to pay? So will the pay gap between men and women increase? And we have an opportunity to mitigate these possible risks. Our report also cites a concern with the pandemic that could widen student achievement gaps that currently exist because of disparities in attainment based on race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. We're concerned that if the current online educational tools and instruction is ineffective, and if we continue to have these disparities in access to technology and broadband, we'll see additional disparities. 
And the achievement gap has longer term implications for students' careers and the health of our economy as a whole. So addressing achievement gap and these issues represents a huge opportunity to help students be more successful and ultimately create career possibilities and improve the economy. One additional insight that I'll note, um, we at Red Hat, like many of our tech company peers, are offering additional benefits to support our people, particularly caregivers through the, the pandemic. So right now, we're driving conversations across our entire global population, asking people about the support that would be most helpful for them over the medium and long term. For example, we're exploring emergency child care through services like care.com, which is available in most countries we do business and supporting tutoring and other educational services that would help children and families outside of the virtual classroom. And a broader range of mental and physical well-being support measures, including flexibility around work hours through relentless prioritization. And we're very fortunate. We have the opportunity and the resources to offer these services, which now seem long overdue, um, but many employers can't afford this type of support. And while um, some families benefit, you know, from this, a lot of it will just scratch the surface on what they need. Um, but it's notable that when businesses are picking up the slack of trying to close these gaps, this will potentially exacerbate the gap for socioeconomically challenged families. And this topic connects directly to the discussion in our report um, for the renewed focus on diversity and inclusion and dismantling systemic racism. Some entities will have the resources to lean in to action and response and some will not, and that creates additional risk. So with that, for a deeper discussion of these issues, as well as um, changes in work, travel, and mitigation, migration patterns, I'll hand it over to Professor Jim Johnson. Thank you very much, Ms. Alexander. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be with you. My name is Jim Johnson. I'm a professor of strategy and entrepreneurship in the Keenan Flagler Business School, director of the Urban Investment Strategy Center at the Frank Hawkins Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise. I'd like to set some context for my remarks by talking about uh, how attractive the state of North Carolina is as a migration destination. Typically, when I give talks about this, I say North Carolina is all that in a bag of chips plus dip in terms of its attractiveness as a destination. In 2017, every day, seven days a week, during 65 days of the year, on average, we received 194 newcomers. That's every day, seven days a week, during 65 days of the year. Newcomers from every other region of the country, newcomers from nearly every other state, newcomers from small, medium, and large size communities all over the country. As a consequence, we were the third most popular migration destination nation behind Florida and Arizona. Uh, we gained uh a population net growth between 2010 and 2018 of 932,000 additional newcomers on top of, an, of a 2.1 million between uh, 2000 and 2010. My math says that's close to 300 million, uh, 3 million newcomers to our state since uh, 2000. Uh, the newcomers uh, is dr uh, population is driven by people of color, immigrants, uh, Asians and Hispanics uh, growing at incredible rates. Uh, doesn't mean that other people aren't coming. They're all, everyone is coming, but those groups are driving growth in our population. And the newcomers, it is noteworthy, brought a migration dividend to the state. What does that mean? It means that the newcomers on average arriving in our state arrive with more per capita adjusted gross income than the people leaving our state and the people who live in our state. So they add consumer purchasing power and they contribute to the tax base of our state. That's the good thing of being an attractive migration destination, growing diversity, increasing wealth. And, uh, unfortunately, that uh, wealth and population growth is not evenly distributed in our state. If you look at the 932,000 people we've added since 2010, 42% of that growth is accounted, concentrated in two counties, Wake and Mecklenburg. About 75% of that growth is, con is concentrated in 10 counties, and 95% of it is concentrated in about 23 counties. In other words, we are creating demographic winners and losers in terms of our um, prosperity, demographic, demographic driven prosperity. Uh, what that means is, is that 
uh, we have a number of counties, 42 to be precise, that lost population between 2010 and 2019. And actually some of them have been losing population for quite some time. In fact, there are 22 counties in the state of North Carolina where deaths exceed births and out migration exceeds in migration. When you're in that situation, more deaths than births and more out migration than in migration, you're literally a dying county. These are the counties that Jim, Jim, Jimmy and Delisa and David and, and, and Greg all were referring to of those counties that are being left behind. Uh, those are the medically underserved counties where hospitals are at risk of closing or have already closed, where are challenged by telemedicine because they have broadband issues. Uh, and they are also challenged by digital literacy problems. Just because you bring telemedicine and broadband there, you have to do the education of the people how to use that work. So this, these 42 uh, counties where we're losing population, we have to figure out how to re-engineer growth in those communities uh, if we're going to thrive and prosper as a state. We're only as strong as our weakest link. The other thing that I'd like to do really quickly is talk about the demographic headwinds that I see coming. Uh, they've been referred to, I wanna add a little specificity to them. The first one, of course, is this geographic disparity, but there are several groups that I think we need to pay attention to if we're going to achieve equity and be more inclusive as a state. The first group, uh, vulnerable African-American older adults. They are the most vulnerable population in this country, in the state. Um, 86,000 households with 175,000 people living in them. Most of them are older adults living either independently or as married couples, but increasingly a lot of them are multi-generational households where the older adults are taking care of their biological children, adult biological children, and grandchildren sometimes on a median income of about $15,000 per year, living in a house, the median age of about 40 years old, uh, and it's just a disaster waiting to happen because those houses probably got all kinds of environmental risk of exposure to uh, things that detract from your life and are probably responsible for the increasing vulnerability something to something like the COVID-19 pandemic. So these African-American older adult households are one of the vulnerable groups. A second vulnerable group has been referred to is the working poor population in North Carolina. People who work every day, sometimes at full-time jobs or increasingly at multiple part-time jobs, but do not earn enough income to live an above poverty level existence. Uh, we've talked about those individuals in the hospitality sector and the retail sector and the like as being most wrong, those essential workers, some of them in healthcare. But what most people don't realize is that a, a significant share of the working poor in North Carolina and nationally more generally are civil servants, police officers, fire personnel, EMS personnel, and most importantly, public school teachers who do not earn enough money to have an above poverty level existence. Um, some of you may know I have a school uh, for vulnerable children in Durham. Two years ago, I had four homeless teachers at the school, all with master's degrees. And so when we start talking about the working poor, and I think David was referencing this when he talked about how this pandemic and the economic downturn is not gonna just impact uh, blue collar workers, but increasingly white collar workers, we're already there in terms of this working poor population. So we need to figure out a livable wage strategy for those folks. Uh, the, the, the other group, third group that I want to talk about really quickly is the less than college educated 25 to 44 year old population that nationally is experiencing a demographic depression, it is argued. These are the people where, this is the population in, in which suicides, alcohol and drug overdose deaths have been so high in three out of the last four years that it's affecting the life expectancy at birth. Last year alone, 157,000 people lost their lives as a function of suicides, alcohol, and drug-related deaths uh, in this country. In North Carolina, that population, 25 to 44, there are 2.6 million and 922,000 of them have less than a college education. In 2018, it's just one indicator of the challenge here. 45 million opioid pills were dispensed in North Carolina, an average of about 43 per person. 
but in some of our rural counties, between 70 and 110 pills per capita were dispensed. In 2018, we had 1,718 overdose deaths, an average of five per day, 6,764 hospital emergency department visits, an average of 18 per day, and 3,723 naloxone reversals, an average of 10 per day. These are prime working age individuals that we're going to need to propel our economy. We got to figure out how to deal with this demographic depression among that population. My last uh, two groups really quickly is uh, the one that uh, Ms. Alexander was referring on when you talk about kids uh, in our education system. There's a whole cadre of young people who are experiencing what I call a triple whammy of geographic disadvantage. They are concentrated in counties where there's either little political or financial support for their education, and they come from neighborhoods characterized by hypersegregation and concentrated poverty. And the schools that they're attending or eight have aging infrastructure where mold, mildew, radon, and a whole range of other environmental risks are a problem for them. This is the next generation of talent that has to prepare our state, and we have to figure out and make sure that we uh, ensure that they have a high quality education. The last point that I will make, but most people don't pay attention to, is the huge sex ratio imbalance in higher education. If you look at our higher ed the composition of higher education uh, institutions in this country, the sex ratio has been 60% female, 40% male for a decade. I assure you at birth, the sex ratio is not 60-40, it's more like 50-50. And so the question becomes, what, where are the men? In 2019, the UNC system was 42% male and the uh, predominantly white institutions was 44% male. The minority serving institutions and the his historically black colleges were 35% male and the system granted 45,000 more degrees to women than to men between 2014 and 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, it is difficult to have stable families, two Werner households to, gener to, limit, to generate the kind of wealth that we, we are accustomed to talking about in this country when you have that kind of enormous sex ratio imbalance in higher education. We need to figure out how to fix that problem. This has enormous implications for family formation, marriage, and a whole range of other things in our society. At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to win on talent and we have to fix these problems if we're going to uh, rest assured that we are gonna remain a highly attractive place to live, do business, play, and work on a daily basis. Thanks so much, and I'll return it to uh, Mackenzie. Great, thank you so much, Professor Jim Johnson, and thank you to all of our panelists for those terrific insights. We are gonna move into the Q&A portion uh, of our briefing at this time, so for those who have joined us via webinar, you are welcome to submit your questions using that Q&A function there at the bottom of your screen. For those joining us by phone, you can email me your questions at mckenzie underscore bab at keenan-flagler.unc.edu. I've already received a few via email, so we're going to get started with those. The first is for Jimmy. With so many hospitals operating at a loss, do you think this will present opportunities for the healthcare and insurance industries to finally work together to make healthcare more affordable? And if so, what are some of the changes we might see? Great question. Uh, so for starters, the healthcare and insurance industries are aligned. Uh, they both benefit from reduced cost of delivery of care and increasing access to quality mm -hmm. care, which is an equally important um, part of this argument. Um, telemedicine can help. And uh, so what changes might we see? I mean, I think now that the, the seal has been broken on telemedicine, um, uh, certainly for routine care, you may see consumers start to demand it, and they should. And we, would, we should encourage them to do so, and we should encourage providers and insurers to support a migration to um, telemedicine where it's feasible. The second thing I would say is that federal and state leaders need to commit to reversing the trend of the decline of rural hospitals. Um, this is going to take federal and state dollars, and we need to commit to do it. Um, it's uh, medically underserved communities, as Professor Johnson said, uh, um, are part and parcel of racial disparity, and it needs to change. It needs to change now. Uh, the third thing I would say is that um, public health has come to the fore, and this is going to be somewhat self-serving because 
Uh, I'm a, a proud graduate of the UNC School of Public Health and also the Business School. Um, but public health has come to the fore during COVID, and we should keep it there. Uh, public health professional, professionals have been on our TVs during the entire crisis. Uh, they've been in our living rooms. They've been educating us. But now, uh, once we have tackled COVID, and we will, we need to change the discourse more to health education and health literacy, again, as Jim Johnson said. Um, public health professionals have shown their value, their quality, their integrity during this entire crisis. And to, um, to return them to the shadows uh, after COVID has passed would be a lost opportunity. So I would say um, number three, in my opinion, uh, again, changing the discourse from COVID and pandemic and crisis to health education and literacy would be a great seized opportunity. Terrific, thank you so much, Jimmy. Um, I, our next question is for, for David. Um, so uh, David, the question that came in is, could the shift toward a lower risk tolerance among investors actually push some to focus on smaller local opportunities on the assumption that they could build closer relationships with these types of companies? Well, I think it can, but absent from the current public discussion about this has to do with investor expectations. And when losses go up, expectations for returns go up. And it's a, it's a fundamental, and that's what I meant by we're going to have to have more public-private partnerships to augment that otherwise abject for-profit model uh, to deal with some of the lower. It's, it's like uh, low-income housing. Uh, it needs public support. And so I think from a private equity standpoint and from an investment standpoint, we're going to need to have more public-private partnerships to fuel growth in smaller companies that may not have the return profile of larger investments. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, the next question is for Delissa. Delissa, you mentioned that not all companies have the funds to offer flexibility and additional support to employees during the pandemic. What guidance would you give to those companies and to their employees as they work to stay afloat? Mackenzie, I'm so sorry, but I lost your audio there. Could you repeat that? Yes, my apologies. Can you hear me okay now? That's better. Yeah. It was just kind of going in and out. Oh, sorry. My, yeah, technology struggles. It's the theme of 2020. <laughs> um, so the, the question here is, um, you mentioned that not all companies have the funds to offer flexibility and additional supports to employees during the pandemic. What guidance would you give to those companies and to their employees as they work to stay afloat? Mm, that's a tough question. So um, there are disparities that we want to make sure, you know, that we try to mitigate as much as possible. And so the one thing that I think that every company can do is to think about itself as being, you know, kind of a, a corporate human humanitarians. I think that this, this um, pandemic has really shifted the way that we have relationships between people across companies and our opportunity to really live into being our full selves, being transparent about the challenges that we all face, whether we're in the management side or we're a worker, and um, and just really demonstrating that, you know, there's a great human kind of ailment going on right now and that together, um, working together and collaborating versus creating more of a, an us versus them uh, situation. I think that's the best way that companies can work together to um, with their people to be able to get through the crisis. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is um, is back to Jimmy. Um, COVID has already interrupted healthcare for other issues. As we focus on treatment and prevention, namely a vaccine. Will it also disrupt research and treatment for other diseases such as AIDS and cancer? And what could be the consequences if that happens? Another really good question. So the unfortunate answer is yes, it is, it is gonna be disruptive. Um, with limited resources to put towards healthcare R&D and the infrastructure required for pharmaceutical and healthcare research and development, um, a diversion of resources towards um, vaccine development and healthcare development and um, clinical research effort 
for experimental therapies for um, COVID uh, certainly are going to divert resources and effort, um, and it will set us back, sadly, in some of the other research and development efforts that we have underway. Um, the, uh, the, the impact of that um, will, uh, um, will trickle down um, and will probably be felt in the coming years. It's very hard to recover from these sorts of things. Uh, one example would be the clinical research industry. So clinical trials and clinical trials suffering to or struggling to enroll participants right now, um, either because people are afraid to come into a healthcare facility or because um, the healthcare providers that are needed to run those clinical trials are not available because they're, they're being diverted into other um, functions within a hospital or hospital or within a healthcare system um, will uh, will make it so that readouts on clinical trials um, and their ability to get their their new medicines approved will be extended. Um, some trials will be disrupted um, uh, for you know, uh, for a long period of time, and those some of those trials that have been disrupted that require longitudinal observation will not be able to be resumed. So um, the clinical development and the research and development piece um, will be quite disruptive. Um, so unfortunately, I think that's not the most positive answer, but uh, a sad reality of what we're going through right now. Yeah, thank you for that, Jimmy. It's helpful. Um, our next question is for uh, for Jim. So Jim, uh, this one, I'm, I'm very interested to hear your response on this one. I know that you've, you've put out some recent research on pandemic migration, so eager to hear you respond to this question. Uh, the question is, North Carolina urban areas may gain from in-migration, but many of these areas already have problems with gentrification and with underserved populations being forced out. What can be done to keep these populations in their homes and their communities as more and more folks um, influx amid the pandemic? Excellent question. Fantastic question. Um, uh, what's important is uh, creating and for these communities to create an equity toolkit to make sure that people have uh, equitable access to opportunities that we uh, put into place policies, practices, and procedures that stem the tide of economic and residential dislocation while at the same time figuring out how to maintain the attractiveness of these communities to newcomers. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the big emphasis is on thinking about uh, the policies and procedures, uh, we call it the equity toolkit. Uh, if uh, We just finished one for the city of Durham. Uh, uh, in, in fact, it's called Built to Last, where we lay out a whole series of policies, procedures, and practices that need to change. You know, one of the big things that if we want to create economic opportunity that enables people to make, stay in their homes and, and in their communities, there are a whole series of workforce rules that need to be changed, particularly for the licensing occupations. Uh, if, and we are, we are one of the most strenuous uh, states when it comes to licensing. If you've had a brush with the law, there are many occupations, even if you have paid your dues by doing your time, as it were, that when you get out, you cannot get a license to practice in that particular trade. And so there are lots of policies like that that have to change if we're going to create more equitable and inclusive societies. And if we want to build businesses and sustainable small businesses in those communities, we have to look at, as Greg talked about at the uh, outset, we have to look at contracting and procurement and make that process far more inclusive and equitable in communities because it is not very equitable and inclusive at this particular point in time. So there are a whole series of policies and procedures that need to be put into place. We call it the equity toolkit. Uh, and I think that that's what increasingly many cities around the, the, the country are putting into place to achieve uh, a more inclusive society. Excellent, thank you so much, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is for the full group. So we can do a, a round robin on this one. Um, and based on the report's findings, what should voters be asking of elected officials and other policymakers as we head toward the historic November election? So I'm gonna open that one up for the group. Um, I'm happy to take a first crack at it. 
I think there was uh, a lot of hope that we were going to have some additional stimulus, federal um, stimulus. Uh, those prospects um, seem to be fading, but I, I do think there's an important need for some additional stimulus. Um, my personal opinion is it probably didn't need to be as large as what um, the, the uh, Democrats were initially proposing, um, but probably needs to be more than the last offer that I saw the Republicans proposing. So there probably is some middle ground in there that would be good for the economy. And this, this really needs to be focused less on sort of the emergency lockdown type measures of handing out um, you know, generous um, benefits to make sure people can, can withstand the kind of short run um, pandemic and more towards um, a, a longer term structural approach towards what the economy um, needs going forward. Um, so some of this will be around, uh, it, in my opinion, should be around, um, uh, you know, reskilling uh, people who have been dislocated um, currently. Um, I think it should also be focused towards um, making sure that people are able to get back to work um, quickly because of the disruption to education and childcare. Um, I think one very obvious thing to do would be provide additional support to states. Um, really one of the worst things we can do right now is have states be cutting their budgets, which is only going to reinforce um, some of the, the, um, the negative economic consequences of the pandemic. One thing I would love to see happen is we have record unemployment among uh, recent college graduates right now. And uh, the, those are eager, bright, talented students that could be put to work in schools uh, or even remotely um, in assisting teachers in education, which is just a tremendous, tremendous need right now. And there's tremendous um, inequality um, that is going to um, not, not just persist, but get worse. Um, because of gaps in educational attainment given the current situation that we're in. So I'd love to see um, some solution around that from policymakers um, in the, as quickly as possible. Kenzie, my question is quick, so I'll ask it, which is uh, what aggressive actions are you going to take to make healthcare more accessible and affordable, especially in medically underserved communities, and how are you going to pay for it? I'll kind of pick up on that, and there's a there's an enormous opportunity that I offend someone with this because this will sound partisan, but I kind of go back to where I finished off um, in the category of the government working with the private sector. When we solve the pandemic, it will be in no small part because the federal government leveraged its capacity to invest in private companies who had the talent and the incentive to get it done, to, to sort of get, to get the government out of the way. And for 40 or 50 years, among the most intractable problems we've had in this country, the government has tried to do it by itself and without intending to be partisan, uh, we, we've got to find other opportunities to solve rural health care, to, to solve retraining, um, with government working hand in hand. And I feel like for whether Democrat or Republican or not, the government has been the enemy of private enterprise. And that's not what built this company, this country rather. So I, I would ask them, where will you leverage the model of, of the government working hand in hand uh, with private enterprise to solve these, these problems? And I loved uh, Jim Johnson's the equity toolkit the equity, the government can help with the equity, but they then need to set some thoughtful rules and get out of the way and let the private sector execute. David, I agree strongly with that. Uh, the public-private partnership piece and the um, and what was written in the Seven Forces document about that, I think is really important. And it's something that we should focus on um, as a country and as a state. Um, the the public-private partnerships especially in healthcare and healthcare delivery will be essential. Mackenzie, I would add that I think that we need to we need to advocate for what I call resiliency enhancing strategies that enhance the competitiveness and track and attractiveness of our communities. We have a strategic opportunity, a propitious opportunity to facilitate those 
and I, I don't like partnerships, I call them mutually beneficial strategic alliances because I think the only way this is going to work is that we ensure that there's a return on the investment for every party, party involved in these relationships. So how do we create, create a system where we generate mutually uh, beneficial strategic alliances across the for-profit government and nonprofit sectors to fix spaces and places in our society and in our communities. Uh, all of that infrastructure that needs to be fixed that is taking years from people's lives, whether it be sick buildings, uh, you know, employment centers, sick schools, all those things, those are opportunities for business development and job creation in our society. Uh, um, how do we deal with climate justice in this state? How do we build resilient communities? Let's look at entrepreneurial approaches to poverty alleviation, job creation, and community development in our society. At the end of the day, we all win because it's a healthier, more attractive, and viable set of communities. I think we have the, the, the wherewithal to do that. Whether we have the will is a different uh, uh, issue, but it, I think it's it's a clear avenue to success for us or resiliency. Well, I'll add that you know we could have a huge opportunity to support long-term structural changes in the way we think about education. Mm -hmm. You know, the pandemic has been kind of the great equalizer in that everyone is at home, and so the school environment itself could kind of be out of the way in terms of the impediment, but we need to invest in the capabilities of our teachers to be able to um, help create capabilities of students in a virtual environment and also the technology and the access has got to be addressed, but it's a huge opportunity for us to, to move away from what has been in our, in our way in the past. That's right. That's great. I, I know that we are right at time. So at this point, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their insights. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for the thought provoking questions. I know we didn't get to all of the questions, so I apologize. But for those of you who would be interested in continuing the conversation with any of our panelists, you're welcome to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to set up an interview. Um, again, I would I would invite you all to visit kenaninstitute.unc.edu slash seven spelled out S-E-V-E-N forces uh, for a look at the full report as, as well as the supplemental report offering those additional insights that are um, germane specifically to those here in North Carolina. Um, thank you again so much everyone for attending. Thank you for your time and thanks again to our panelists. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.